after speaking about definition of usul al-fiqh, the author is giving a short chapter on knowledge, al-ilm. And the reason why he's mentioning al-ilm as a separate chapter, because if you look at both definitions of usul al-fiqh as a whole and fiqh by itself, his technical definition, the first word he uses was ilm. Naam? For usul al-fiqh, he said ilmun bi qawaida. For fiqh, he said al-ilmu bil ahkami. So now it's appropriate to define what is knowledge. He's going to tell you right now exactly what is meant by knowledge. Naam? And this chapter, it contains aspects of a science called al-mantiq. Al-mantiq, ikhwani akhawat, I'm going to take some time to explain this. It's a very controversial subject to many Muslims. And that is due to a lot of confusion about its reality. Mantiq is a science, yani logic, is a science from the ulum al-ala. Yani it is a science that's used as a tool. And it's not from the ulum al-ghayat. So when we talk about ulum al-ghayat, then there are three. You have tafsir, hadith, and fiqh. Okay, these are the sciences you to busy yourself with these sciences. Tafsir, the meanings of the Quran. Hadith, the meanings of hadith. And fiqh, what is the fiqh? That's derived from tafsir and hadith. You have other sciences which are known as ulum, ulum al ala. Okay, and these are known as what? Uh, sciences that are used that are tools to help you understand tafsir, to help you understand hadith, and to help you to understand fiqh. So for example, a science to help you understand tafsir is what? Usul tafsir. A science to help you understand hadith is what? Usul or mustalah hadith. Okay? A science to help you understand fiqh is what? Usul al-fiqh. Naam? And there are other sciences as well. Like, for example, Arabic language, uh, Nahu, Saf, Balagha, eloquence, Nam. And among these sciences as well is Mantik. Mantik is categorized logic as the Ilm al Ala. Everyone with me so far? So these sciences, Ulum al Ala, are only used to the extent that will help you to understand tafsir, hadith, and fiqh. Tayyip? Mantiq in particular is something that only scholars and specialists in usul of fiqh should busy themselves with to learn and not the layman people. So let's mention that outright, that mantiq is something in which only scholars, those who have knowledge of the sharia and those who are specialists in usul of fiqh should learn and busy themselves with and not who? The layman people. We mentioned earlier that Mantik has a bad reputation. One of the reasons as to why it has a bad reputation is because of its origins and how it was, quote unquote, introduced to the Muslim Ummah. It was introduced to the Muslim Ummah through ancient Greek philosophy. And this was as a result of a, a king, Al Ma'mun, Al Abbasi, perhaps you heard of his name. Right, if you're familiar with the story of Imam Ahmed, then I'm sure you heard of this name before. Right, he was a ruler at one point, a Abbasi ruler. Okay, and yeah, the Imam exactly. I said to the Khalq al Quran. Um, so what he did when he was the ruler, he contacted some of the Christians that had access to uh, ancient Greek philosophy, had their manuscripts, and he contacted them and wanted them to send copies to them. To the Muslim land, okay? And at first, the, the Christian kings, those who had the power and had access to this material, they deliberated as to whether they should do so or not. And then one of the elder priests, now he said, yes, we should send it, send these manuscripts to them because there's no ummah, there's no sharia, there's no legislation that have been mixed with this knowledge except that this knowledge has caused them to go astray. SubhanAllah. Subhanallah. Tayyip. So they sent it and fitna occurred as a result of that. Right? It was translated to Arabic, and the Muslims, some of the Muslims started to busy themselves with this ancient Greek philosophy. Now, 
the people who were involved in studying this knowledge before it came to the Muslim lands were, of course, heretics, right? Aristotle, so people, and those who follow them. And people who had serious doubts related to a creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, these heretics, they would author books that contain blatant kufr, like falsafa, philosophy, ilmul kalab. And how would they prove these points, make it convincing? They would use principles in mantiq, logic, to prove their points. Okay? And because mantiq, logic, was contained in those books of kufr and the arguments of the kufar, it was seen as a whole as something wrong because this knowledge came with falsafa and ilm al-kalam. So it's completely wrong along with that. Now, additionally, you had Muslims at that time when it first entered the Muslim world, they would, some of them would engage with these books and then apply these false principles to Islam. And then they would reach to erroneous conclusions like, Kufr, straight up kufr. SubhanAllah, we are the billah. May Allah protect us. Now, as a result, scholars of Islam, they differed as, as it related to engaging with mantiq that was mixed with Greek philosophy and ilm al-kalam and falsafa. Okay, so right now we're speaking about, let's see if we could draw this, make it clearer. So you have a big circle here, right? And in this circle, you had mantik, I'll put an M here. You had falsafa, I'll put RF, falsafa. Uh, ilm al-kalam, put a K. Right? They were all mixed together in this one bubble. And this is how the books came. And the Muslims were benefiting from these books, or some of them were benefiting from these books, and it led them to kufr. Now, scholars, they differed as to whether people, especially scholars, should study this, this knowledge. And you had scholars of the past who did benefit from it and wrote books on it. Like, for example, Al-Baydawi has a book called Tawali Al-Anwar. His book, Tawali Al-Anwar, is upon this methodology where it mentions all three, okay? And he's a Muslim scholar. But scholars, like I mentioned, they differ. So they differ into three positions. And as mentioned in the line of poetry, وَالْخُلْفُ فِي جَوَازِ الْإِشْتِغَالِ بِهِ عَلَى ثَلَاثَةٍ أَقْوَالِ فَابْنُ الصَّلَاحِ وَالنَّوَاوِ حَرَّمَ وَقَالَ قَوْمٌ يَنْبَغِي أَنْ يُعْلَمَ وَالْقَوْلَةُ الْمَشْهُورَةُ الصَّحِيحَةِ جَوَازُهُ لِكَامِلِ الْقَرِيحَةِ مُمَارِسِ السُنَّةِ وَالْكِتَابِ لِيَهْتَدِي بِهِ إِلَى الصَّوَابِ So in these three, three lines or four lines of the Sulam, the poet, he mentioned that the scholars, the were broken down to three positions as it relates to studying this mixture of mantiq with falsafa and kalam. And the first position of scholars like Ibn Salah, Ibn as Salah, also Imam al Nawawi, the Bayt mentioned when Nawawi, Nawawi, this is known as Ishba in the Arabic language, when you give an extra alif, okay? But his name is an Nawawi, and it's permissible in the Arabic language to do this. Like, for example, Laqad, some Poetry, you finally say la qad. They add an extra alif for la qad. La qad. And this is what's known as ishba' in Arabic language. Taib. Imam Nawawi was a student of Ibn Salah, famous scholar, 670, 60 after And they took the position of it being unequivocally haram. Haram. Yani, you cannot study it no matter what. It's completely haram, 100%. First, first position okay for obvious reasons i mean uh what we mentioned earlier one the books that mentioned mantik were found in the bo books of greek philosophy and it contained blatant contradictions to our deen okay also they found that uh busying oneself with this knowledge will obviously take you away from busying yourself with the quran was sunnah which is better also they saw that the people who were engrossed with this knowledge they were heretics. They were confused people. They were innovators who opposed our sharia. Now, Ibn Salah even said that it's obligatory that it's obligatory to remove the teachers of mantiq from the schools and for, and for the repentance to be sought or else they'll be killed. So the scholars, they were very stern with this. Now, and without a doubt, 
the people who engross themselves with this, these three put together as it came and entered the ummah and they give preference to this over the Quran and Sunnah, they're misguided, right? We as Muslims are, are commanded to find the Quran and Sunnah. Now, Ibn Asiyuti, rahimahullah ta'ala, he even has a risala called al qawlul Mushriq fi Tahrim in Mantiq, where he speaks about the impermissibility of learning this, now, these three put together. So this is the first position. The second position is the opposite of the first position, and that is that is unequivocally permissible. Rather, it is recommended to study. Okay, and this is the position of Imam uh, Abu Hamid al Ghazali. Ghazali. Abu Hamid al Ghazali, who died what year? 105 years after Hijrah, Taqriban. He went to the other end, I don't want to say extreme, because what Imam Ibn Salah and Nawid said unequivocally haram is not an extreme. Rather, it's a safe position. Okay, so Imam Ghazali went to the other end. And he said it is permissible. In fact, he said that لا ثقة بعلم من لا يعرف المنطق that there's no we cannot trust the knowledge of the one who doesn't know منطق logic. Right? He even wrote books on it, and he called it uh, the measuring stick of knowledge. He called it معيار العلوم that منطق is the measuring stick of knowledge. You judge a person, a scholar, based off their knowledge on logic. It's another end, the other end, no? And it's a bit extreme, without a doubt. The third position is that it is permissible, it is permissible for the scholar, the learned scholar to learn, not the regular folk or people, okay? And not just any type of scholar, but a scholar who has a sound understanding, who has mastered and busied himself with the Quran with Sunnah and know the text and understands the, the Sharia as a whole. And is and is mutadallir in that. Okay, he's, he's proficient, mahir in the sharia. Now, uh, the reason for this permissibility for the scholar as opposed to regular folk is because the scholar would be able to distinguish the truth from the falsehood and benefit from the mantit principles within, the logic principles within. Now, and this is similar to a baby and an adult at a beach, for example. If the baby doesn't know how to swim, and he goes in the water, what will happen? He will naturally drown. La qadar Allah, may Allah protect us all in our families. I mean, if he has no guidance, he will drown automatically. But the adult who knows how to swim, is experienced in swimming, knows how to navigate through the waters. Sah? He knows what, when he sees strong currents or waves coming, or maybe even a shark, a shark, subhanAllah, he'll know when to get out. Sah? Likewise, the alim. A scholar who is well versed in the Quran and Sunnah, he's able to look at this pile and distinguish and sift through that which is correct and that which is incorrect. Everyone understand this? And this is the third position uh, taken by a group of scholars as well. Remember, these positions are in relation to what? Mantik being joined along with falsafa and ilmul kalam. Everyone understand this? These are three positions related to what? There's these three things are mixed together. Okay? After some time, you find that scholars took out mental from the filth of falsafa and ilm al-kalam, and they made it separate. They made the principles of mantiq, logic, as something separate. Okay? They made it its own science, free of kufr, free of the principles of uh, mentioned falsafa and ilm kalam, and made it its own science related to the principles of logic. And this science by itself, logic, mantiq, by itself is permissible to study to many of scholars. And you find that there are many books that are studied by the ulama even today, like a shamsiya, like a sulam al munawraq also pronounced al murawnaq right, with the tabdeel of the ra and the noon. Mi'ya uh, al These books only speak about al-mantiq, okay? And even though Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimah wa ta'ala, he famously said, la yahtaju ilayhi sahibu dhihni salim, that the one who has, uh, you know, a sound intellect, sound dhihn, mind, okay? He doesn't need to learn the science. 
he himself, rahimahullah ta'ala, learned these sciences of, of mantik and the principles of mantik, and he used the same exact principles to refute and destroy the arguments of the philosophers he debated. Now I'm taking a look at this book, Daru Ta'arud al-Aqli wa Naqli, yani the rejection of conflict between reason and revelation. You see, it's filled with mantik principles. He uses principles to debunk the Mu'tazila and the Jahmiya and many of the uh, philosophers and their false ideologies. He used mantik, the principles of mantik, against them. So he himself learned it. No? And even today in Saudi Arabia, in the universities here, in the first semester, every student who studies Sharia, the first semester, they study al mantiq Nam is placed in the first semester, right? And the, among the reasons mentioned, that is to separate the weak students from the diligent ones, the serious students, those who, because mantik is a bit difficult, right? And not everyone can uh, study it and understand it. So it sifts through the serious students who, are, who really want to progress in Sharia and the students who aren't able to, they have a chance to transfer to the other kulliyat. Now, so it's studied even in today, Saudi Arabia. And this is a clear rebuttal of those uh, overly confident people, I like to say, who like to make the claim that scholars, they have no knowledge of mantik, they're not people of reason, they don't have any type of intellect. May Allah guide us all. The ulama here, this is the first thing studied in Sharia, in BA. Now, so the scholars here are well versed in this science. Uh, and in Mantik is also referred to as Khadim al Ulum, the servant of the rest of the sciences, or Ra'is al Ulum, the president or the leader of the other sciences, or Mizan al Ulum, the scale of other sciences. And among the benefits of study in Mantik is that. First and foremost, it allows us to understand the speech of the scholars, to understand the speech of the scholars in their works, uh, especially in usul al-fiqh. They mention these terms, like I mentioned earlier, excuse me, if you don't understand the term, the terminology, then how can you understand the discussion? Similar to medical school or engineering, there are special, specific terminologies used for each science. Ilmun Mantik is the terminologies of Usul al Fiqh. And you find it in the books of Usul al Fiqh. So, to even follow the discussion, you have to know these terms, what it means, what the scholar is referring to. Naam? And it's not only limited to Usul Ikhwan al Akhwat. When you read Tafsir books, when you read Fiqh books, when you read even Tawheed books, speaking about Aqeedah, they mention these terms. Naam? So, this is the first benefit of studying Mantik. The second benefit, barakallahu fikum, is to understand how the people of misguidance use text to affirm meanings that contradict the understanding of our salaf and how to destroy their arguments, like what Ibn Taymiyyah did. Naam, rahimahullah. Additionally, learning mantiq, uh, it helps us to protect ourselves from falling into that same evil that those people fell into. Right? If you learn evil, then you protect yourself from that evil. As I mentioned in the line of poetry, I learned evil not for the purpose of you know, practicing that evil or implementing that evil or spreading that evil, but for the purpose of protect myself from it. And whoever does not know evil from the good, he most certainly will fall into that evil. Now, this is why when we study a tawheed, what do we also study? Do we study tawheed and khalas? That's it. We also study what? A shirk. Why? For what purpose? Why do we have detailed books on shirk? So that we can stay away from it. Likewise, with mantik, we study mantik so that we can stay away from the misguidance that other people fell into. Also, studying mantik trains the mind. It's like the riyadah of the mind. It's like an exercise for the brain, okay? And it gives you an organized way, method of thinking to ensure that you do not fall into error. As mentioned in Sulam, وَبَعْدُ فَالْمَنْطِقُ لِلْجَنَانِ نِسْبَتُهُ كَنَّحْوِ لِلْلِسَانِ Allah Akbar. The Shaykh mentions that mantiq, logic for the mind, لِلْجَنَانِ is like grammar for the tongue. Studying mantiq for the mind 
is like grammar for the tongue. Just as nahu, grammar, prevents you and protects you from falling into linguistical mistakes, which will then lead to misunderstandings. Now, likewise, mantik, it protects you. It safeguards you from falling into errors in terms of your thinking. As he mentioned, it safeguards and protects the thoughts from being tempted into falling into error, mistakes, and misguidance. And he's allowing us, the students, to have a, deep, a precise, deep understanding of the issues. Now, so he goes on to mention, uh, to take these principles so that you can benefit from the sciences within. And as his famously mentioned, that من أتقن المهمة من فن المنطق جعل الله العلوم كلها طوع يده That whoever perfects, whoever perfects the most important things in, in the science of a mantiq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the rest of the sciences obedient to him. Yani if you understand mantiq, then you're able to benefit from the ulum al-ghaya. All right? Ulum al-ghayat for the reasons we mentioned. Now, this is the essence of a mantiq, the benefits of studying it. You understand the importance of studying mantiq and its relationship to usul al-fiqh.